Hi, sorry about the hassles. Uh, doing the best we can from Washington, D.C. Welcome to this presentation on the metaverse. My name is David Siegel. You're, you know, I'm just going to ask you to watch the center of the screen and I'll be reading from my notes below. In 2010, I wrote a book about the metaverse, but we didn't call it the metaverse back then. Now I'm pleased to say we're finally starting to build a world I have been describing for 20 years. It brings together the best of VR, AR, blockchain, and open standards to create a platform that I think will be larger than the web itself. In the next 25 minutes, I'll give an overview of where I think we're going. Now, Mark Zuckerberg said, and this is kind of what kicked things off, we will effectively transition from a social media company to being a metaverse company. Now, look, we can't trust everything Mark Zuckerberg says, but today, at least 10,000 people at Facebook are now developing AR, VR devices, interfaces, and experiences for the metaverse. But what is the metaverse? <laughs> Everybody seems to have a different answer. The metaverse, in my view, is simply the real-time, location-aware web. I'm going to define it much more broadly than you have heard. The key is that everything is connected in real time using open standards the way the web itself is. Uh, sorry, I know where to go. All right. So, so one way to think of it is if everything is connected, we have new experiences in the fictional realm, which is games and worlds to explore. An, on, an augmented game, for example, could be one you play in the real world, but game elements would be visible to you if you have the right kind of display. So you can think of it in a display format first. And flat at the bottom is going to be the most common. It means phones, tablets, and the displays we have today. In fact, I think a lot of us will experience the metaverse using wearables, smartwatches, earphones, etc. Um, so it's not just some kind of a goggles experience. And then in the real world is where most of the action is actually going to happen. Um, some of these things will require goggles, but most won't. And more and more, we will augment our experience. And many of them will just be data feeds from the connected web. So I'm going to give plenty. I'm going to give a number of different examples now. We all know about online games, and some people play immersive 3D environments wearing goggles, but many people just play on their phone or on their tablet or on their screen and on their PC. And this is how I see it. I would call that the multiverse, what we have today. We have websites, games, we have places you can go, but you have to log in and you have to enter that world. Each of these uh, companies has to create logins, identity, security, avatars, points, they need a physics engine. They have to handle thousands of users simultaneously. So it's really expensive to create from scratch because you have to build so much infrastructure. But what if we turn this around? What if we put the human at the center? What if you could just enter any online world? You're already logged in. You're carrying everything you need with you. This is the metaverse. Everything connects and you are at the center. It's not vendor driven. If you saw Wreck-It Ralph, uh, you may remember the power strip and the characters from one game could enter several different other games. And the metaverse will be something like that. By building common infrastructure, it will be much easier to build new worlds. So anyone can just add on to what others are building. You don't have to start from scratch. If you need to pay to go somewhere or do something, you can do that easily with money or tokens. So much of this will not be games. Soon, we will create the real-time web in the real world. Now, the, a good way to think about that is Google Earth. Google Earth can't show you anything happening in real time right now. It's static. Much of it is years old, right? But imagine Google Earth with all the parts functioning and everything flowing in real time. The idea is to add real-time heat maps and information of traffic pedestrians, construction, wind, noise, fire, smoke, uh, toddlers running around so you can keep track of them, uh, or pets. Uh, you could look up and you could see the actual flights in the sky at any moment, or you could see drones, or you could go to the top of a roof of a building and look down on yourself looking up. This is the real-time web, regardless of which device you use to experience it. 
Much of what we'll do is build digital twins of everything in the real world, like cities, for example. Launched in 2014 at a cost of over $70 million, Digital Singapore is a dynamic three-dimensional city model and collaborative data platform. It's already being used to help autonomous vehicles navigate the streets in real time and the port optimize traffic flows. In fact, the United Nations is committing to building a digital version of Earth as a platform for digital twins of cities, infrastructure, utilities, and supply chains. Hundreds of cities are now planning their digital twins and have committed to building them in the next few years. This is an active area of development right now. For the metaverse, there will be a set of standards that allow us to visit locations, spaces, and simulations easily. You'll teleport in space and time the way we use the web links today. That's why it has to be open and not owned by one company. Over the next 10 years or so, I expect Facebook to sell more glasses than headsets and Apple to sell more wearables than handsets. In fact, I think within 15 years, most people won't have a handset anymore. I think we'll mostly act, interact with our environment and others using voice. It'll be easy to go back and forth between immersive and augmented environments. This kind of immersive meeting experience could have Zoom for many kinds of meetings, and Facebook is betting on it. And that may be a slightly better experience than what we're having now. But we're going to add many other aspects to the metaverse. That's just that's only a small part of it. We're going to go towards self custody of assets, so we'll be able to do business without intermediaries. As an example, you could buy the rights to play a song as much as you like, but you could also sell that token directly to someone else, and then you don't have the rights, and that person does. The same with real estate or securities or any asset. So blockchain, decentralization and disintermediation will be a big part of the metaverse. That will have a big effect on the legal system, which is already starting to feel the pressure. Look, imagine designing a product and inviting all your vendors into a common workspace to collaborate or a building, for example. As the design evolves, it becomes a living digital environment for the product's entire life cycle. Now, we actually have a few systems like that today. Companies like Boeing and Dassault Systems have them, but they're proprietary, they're very expensive. You have to be invited and it's, it's uh, you know, you have to be a, an approved vendor and everything. And in the metaverse, this kind of platform will be available to everyone, enabling large scale collaboration, you can imagine building whole cities and worlds kind of wiki style. Now, where's your personal data? You don't have it. Your vendors have it. Now, I can't show you my face right now. My camera's turned off, I think, or maybe you can see it, but but your your data is on the apps of all your vendors. You don't have your data. And I've made a completely separate video on this and I'll link to it, but the personal data locker will enable the shift from vendor push to consumer pull. You can learn more about that on my nonprofit website, the Giordano Bruno Institute. Here are a few key parts of it, just a kind of a teaser. So in this world, you'll keep your personal data, but you won't manage your own data. Instead, you'll pay a small amount to store it, You'll hire a number of digital personal assistants to do your work for you. These are your digital employees. Some are even managers. Some are knowledge workers. Some are task oriented. Don't like your digital financial advisor? Fire it and get a different one in the open marketplace. I want to explain why openness is important. Sorry about my bird. Today, a car could just be a block away from you, ready to take you to your destination but you don't have the right app to get it. Even if you have all the apps, it would be hard to find that car logging into all of them. But an open platform lets drivers and riders find each other. Just tell your virtual assistant where you wanna go and the assistant will look for all the offers, keeping you anonymous and the car companies and individuals will send you their offers to take you where you wanna go. And this is what I mean by pull. It's not just an economy of scale, it's an economy of choice. So new people can enter the market easily without gatekeepers, and markets set fair prices. And you're probably familiar with this model if you've ever used Kayak to find a flight. 
I, I think of this as kind of kayaking the kayaking the world. With kayak, you specify where you want to go and when, time of departure, landing, airlines, class, price, all these parameters. And then the flights come to you. The flights are always sorted according to your wishes, not the algorithms, not necessarily, not the, not the ones that make kayak the most money, but the ones that are best for you. What if you can do that for everything from finding a lawyer to finding a babysitter to ordering a pizza, getting a new insurance policy, a new car, a new piece of art or a new phone? The idea, one second, come here. Okay, the idea is to create a nonprofit comparison engine that doesn't have an advertising business model. So wherever, whenever you're looking for anything, you just ask and the answers come to you. The vendors compete for your business. No apps, no websites, no web searches where people are gaming the search algorithm to get to the top. No intermediaries, no advertising. This is the opposite of search where today you have to do most of the hard work to find the things you're looking for. One quick example more, uh, what if you own a Tesla? Let's say you do, Tesla is a platform. You probably haven't read the end user license agreement from Tesla. I'll tell you, you can do anything you want with your driving data except move it to another platform. Tesla owns your driving data. So if you have another car, you rent or borrow a car, you need to keep track of all your transportation data on several different systems. No one's going to do that. So we're all trapped in our vendor's app. In the metaverse, your personal data locker has your all of your driving history on all of your vehicles you've ever used or borrowed or rented. You hire the algorithm that drives whatever car you're allowed to drive. It has a full record of everywhere you've been. It knows where home is. It knows where to pick up your kids from school. It can go get your groceries or your mother by itself. It's your data, your driving preferences, and it interacts with your insurance company to let your car start in the first place. So this is independent of the device. <clears throat> this driving algorithm is independent of the data and you can replace your digital chauffeur if you find a better one any time. Eventually, you'll have your own pilot, career coach, education coach, uh, dating coach, <laughs> emergency medical team, financial controller, lawyer, and much more. You'll have an entire team around the clock, but it won't be humans. It'll be your team of personal digital AI assistants working around the clock. They'll live in the cloud and work for you while you sleep. In 1994, I taught the first generation of web designers what a website was and how to build one. Now in 2021, there are a few thousand creators working on 3D immersive and connected experiences. That number will become millions as we create new worlds, new data flows, and new possibilities. The hardware won't matter. Connections will be everywhere. What matters is your identity and your access to data. People think it's going to look like this, you know, where you're just going to walk down the street and see all this noise. But almost everything you might see like this doesn't really tell you what you need. It's just noise. So instead, your personal assistant knows all the things you may be looking for, may know where you're heading, things that are relevant to you. So you'll only see or hear the few things that you're actually interested in. Otherwise, you can, you'll just have a nice walk down the street. Your bots will do the filtering for you. In my view, the business model is the key. The advertising model, which began in 1833, has reached its peak in today's internet. Many companies get revenues from selling your behavior and attention to advertisers. If you've seen the movie, The Social Dilemma, you understand that this is a vicious cycle that limits our choices and gives advertisers the advantage. When services are free, they cost you more than you think. In the world I wanna create, you pay a bit to store your own data. You pay as you move through experiences, as you get data feeds, as you use your own data to purchase goods and services. In my world, there's zero advertising, which means that worldwide, there will be a little bit less advertising. People will have a choice whether to get services for free, in which case they are the product and they will probably pay more in the long run, or they'll be able to pay a small amount and be in control. For most people, this is an overall win, but we'll have to work hard to change people's habits. And that's what my institution is going to be about. 
One implication of this people don't really take into consideration is dematerialization. Glasses and wearables and better devices will help us interact with this online world. And the, a lot of things we buy today will just go away. The only reason we'll, to go to a trade show or business meeting will be if it's better than the digital alternative. And for dating, you know, that's, that's a big consideration. But most of the time, going to Orlando and listening to some keynote speaker at 8 in the morning and then go visit all the trade show booths, that's only going to work if it's better than the online version. And the online version is going to improve a lot. So we're going to dematerialize a lot of things. Hotels, not only airplanes, but whole airports uh, could go away as we start making better use of our ability to go places and do things in real time. Monitors, just as an example, a lot of other office items may just disappear over the next 20 years. Your office will just be, you know, with you all the time. And if this gives a better reading experience than today's monitors do, you know, you could make printers redundant. So if you think about it, what's important is our data and our AI helpers. And once handsets are gone, there won't be any apps. The metaverse spells the end of the line for apps. That'll bring more and more power to individuals and less to vendors. It'll take some time, but Apple is trying to figure out what apps do in a world of wearables, especially earbuds. Um, I don't know if you want to fire up an app from an earbud. So it might be early days, but it really has started. Riot Games created a virtual metal band for the metaverse. A recent virtual event on the Wave platform drew 2 million viewers, averaging 45 minutes sessions and a thousand interactions per minute on the platform. Sandbox has sold 10,000 plots of digital land that doesn't really exist. Global digital game spending is already at 130 billion. Mobile advertising has broken through 200 billion. The next evolution of this web will be real time and connected. John Radoff's market map shows hundreds of companies already involved. Facebook, Google, Apple, and Microsoft are investing heavily. New startups are springing up every day, and there's even a Metaverse ETF already. So to summarize, the Metaverse is the real-time location-aware web. <clears throat> It'll usher in a new era in games and online experiences, as well as digital twins of many people, places, and things. It'll make people more self-sovereign and less reliant on big companies and governments. People will own their own data. We will have good standards for things like digital identity. We'll form our digital networks on our own terms and the hardware will matter less and less. An open marketplace of personal digital assistance will cause a Cambrian explosion of innovation that will benefit consumers rather than huge tech companies. Apps will go away. Apps are traps. The sooner we get rid of them, the better. The trend of dematerialization will accelerate. We'll be richer and better off and consume fewer physical resources. I think the metaverse is the web. It is where the web is going. I hope to play a pretty serious role in the development of the metaverse uh, by raising a venture fund and uh, being a thought leader, working on standards and governance. Let's just imagine a world where your personal data locker is a real thing and that's kind of your digital home. Then how many dating apps will you want? You probably saw the parallel between dating apps and car ride sharing companies. You know, how many dating apps does a person need? Well, so if you think about it from the consumer's point of view, there's an alternative way to go. And that is to put your dating data onto your own personal data locker and then the algorithms, you know, if you say I'm available, I'm looking for a long-term relationship, I'm looking for a date for Friday night, whatever it is, you say that, and then you can see all the people who are available to you. And in that world, uh, we won't pay anything to store our data and our parameters, but there will be a good market, I think, for the dating coach or the AI that will help make the match, that will help us find other people who are dateable, who are maybe nearby or, you know, whatever meets our criteria or understands that our criteria are fuzzy and helps us learn over time. And many websites do this, but they do all, they have all the data on their platform. In this case, 
the data will just be reside with the individuals and the match will be made by kind of by contract between AIs. You know, somebody else may have her AI, I may have my AI, and they might decide that we should meet. Um, so it's a different world. It's possible to start thinking about that now. It's possible to start investing in it, but it certainly doesn't exist today and it will have to emerge over time. But look, let me say this. I think in 20 years, dating apps will be dead. There will be no dating apps. Um, there will just be a, what I would call smart matching algorithms that you pay, or maybe they're advertising based, I don't know. But the only thing that vendors will really provide is not the data storage and not the identity work, but the but just matchmaking. And there, there could be a whole range of other add-ons as we've seen people in this audience are, are adding value to dating all the time, but that'll all be pretty much a la carte and each person will decide, you know, to rent that capability or not. So it won't be a vendor driven sale anymore. That's my prediction for, you know, I don't know, 10, 20 years from now. I think it could start in the next five years, but it will, you know, it won't be mainstream for a while. Um, now I'm happy to take questions if anybody's left. <laughs> How would the onboarding experience no change when apps are gone? Same number. <laughs> <laughs> Same number as when we started. No one left. Actually, one person left and one person joined us. So, you know, I, I'm trying to get my head around this um, siloing. It sounds like the silos go away. Right now, we've got silos, we've got Bumble, we've got Match. We've That's got right. Zeus, we've got, you know, all these different That's silos right. of humans. The right. human so aspect goes away. You know, here's your data right here, right? This is all your data. Pockets, silos. But you're saying... Right. You you will rent the AI. The AI is, is the philosophy, really. I mean, some of this is going to come down to how do you, what philosophy do you buy into? Uh, what AI do you want to rent that's going to match you? But the actual personal information, how is that going to be accessed? I mean, who owns the metaverse? Nobody owns it. It's just like the web. But so you'll have your data and you'll have your driving data, your family, your kids, your financial, your education, your, your work history, all that'll be there. You know, your everything will be there. Okay. And, and if you're interested in dating, you'll add whatever information you want. There'll be some standardized formats for doing that. This is what my book is about. Paul, mm -hmm. I might've even written about data. This is from 2010. This is kind of describing the world that I'm talking about. And then, uh, and then you want to make a match. So you're, you're going to sort of flip a switch and say, okay, I'm looking for just like kayak right? Or many dating sites, they'll say, I'm looking for, this is what I think I'm looking for. Is it fuzzy? Is it require? Is that a hard requirement and so forth? Or maybe somebody for a date for this weekend, or whatever, or I'll, I'll be in Dubai next weekend. Is there anybody to, to, you know, to go on a date with? And you'll hire the matching algorithm that, do, that does that. It won't be Google. It will be, let's, you know, any of these companies that are in the matching business right now, you know, could provide that algorithm so mm -hmm. that you might pay two bucks a month, whatever, some subscription fee, whatever. And that will go look at all the other people's information on their personal data lockers and then show you kayak style. And it's the same as you'd see on match.com today, right? You see a list of possible matches and, and you go from there, but it'll be done on your platform, not on their platform. The user experience will be on my platform. You, know, you won't have any designers. It'll just be data. Mm -hmm. I think from a from a user experience point of view, from what users would define as their ideal, this is an ideal. Um, I was thinking about what the ideal model for any internet dating company is or social community, and that is that all the people in the world are on a similar on one platform, right? Exactly. So you've got true disintermediation. Right. That's the perfect right. model, but how to get there? Because the incentive base of the companies fueling this is at odds with the ideals of the users in this. In that right. Respect. So, so I'm saying this will be a grassroots movement. It'll happen via the standards and the use cases that I hope to bring out, and the platform, the open source platform that I hope to create, uh, and people will build on it. So it certainly isn't a right around the corner, and I don't think dating will be the driver. So we're going uh, Linux style, basically open source. That's I, I the only way that like can, that. this can be driven. I see. I think of it a bit like that. Like you'll just have the, the you know, you'll hear your, your friends will say, 
well, did you get the personal data locker yet? Whatever the, you know, I don't have a brand name for it yet. Uh, oh, no, you should be, oh, you definitely get that. And then you'll just start in with whatever use cases are relevant to you. It may be your doctor appointments, or it may be your babysitter. It might be, you know, uh, finding restaurant, right? But over time, that will just continue to get more and more powerful. And then at some point, you'll realize you could, you could find a, a date there. What's Facebook? You know, it, role it will take a while to get over to get to critical mass, right? How does Facebook make money off this? Well, my I would be happy to see Facebook go away. Facebook will probably stay with the uh, advertising model for a long time. They'll make the majority of the money and they'll get the majority of the customers. But maybe, you know, I'll have a look. Fifty million people have seen a movie called The Social Dilemma. Mark, mm. if you haven't seen The Social Dilemma. Oh, yeah. You should see the social dilemma. Those are my customers, the people yeah. who get that they don't oh, want yeah. to be the product anymore, right? If you've ever clicked on any of those Facebook stores that want to sell you stuff, those are all scams. All yeah. of them. Right? Um, so I've got a so, couple of questions here. I've got Numer who is asking, how would user onboarding experiences change when apps are gone? Yeah, so I, I hope and it's just my vision and I've been writing about it for 20 years, you'll just have your personal data locker and you'll just start by doing stuff and it will let you into your home. It'll be your digital keys. It'll be your wallet. You know, it'll help you check out in places and it'll just grow and grow, but it'll be your digital home. So you'll onboard once, right? Ideally, you know, you mm. will, I'll connect to you and I'll connect to my other friends and then I can let Facebook go, right? And I'm not yeah. paying any, I'm paying a little bit but Facebook doesn't, you know, we're now going around Facebook. Uh, Rowan asks, do you think that people will use the metaverse in the same way that we use our phones today as a distraction from the real world rather than a more evolved utility uh, to solve specific problems? That's a great question. Right. When I want to go somewhere in Washington, D.C., I use CityMapper. Um, yeah. I'm not stupid enough to think that I can get there the best way, right? It has the data. It knows which... Uh, subway lines are open and where the construction is and what buses and what time I have to be at a bus stop and so forth. So that's what I think, you know, there's tremendous, but it's just logic. You don't need to log into an app for that. Right. So you'll just do that from your personal data locker as well as find a flight or, you know, book a restaurant or, you know, do business, buy stuff. True massive open market. Fascinating. I well, hope, I think my mind. I hope, I mean, look, and would you rather the... shop at Amazon or would you rather shop at all stores in the world combined and just you know find the one thing you're looking for wherever it is? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what users want. Oh, we've got to reconsider the impact for social communities and for internet dating. Apps. I, I, I just need the really money good. to make this happen. I I believe I can make it happen, but I have I'm in fundraising mode. I have to raise the money to, yeah. to do it. You can raise money and then you're going to fuel a, a bunch of startups that look promising, right? That's your role. So I've got two things. I have a start, a, a nonprofit. That's the Giordano Bruno Institute, where we're going to build this Linux, this foundation of the personal data locker. That's nonprofit. And then I'm also, I have three partners and we're raising a venture fund. And we have, we have done the first fund, raised $20 million to do VR and AR investments. And now we're expanding, adding three partners to do raise a two hundred million dollar fund to build all these companies that I hope will be you know the new the new tech not necessarily giants because giants are formed by by lock in right yeah by locking people and by making a sticky platform but but the services that people will need for the open metaverse including dating and online social communities as it as the as it evolves right. Mm -hmm. But that all changes. I mean, it really some is mind people are going to say, Mark, <laughs> some people are going to say, oh, online, you know, metaverse dating is going to be goggles and sitting at a cafe and ordering a little thing and having a conversation across the table. And I don't really care about that at all. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really consider that dating, right? I think the idea is the data and the freedom and the self sovereignty that comes with, yeah. with being your own, you know, your own Google. Your, own, your own match, your your own bumble, your own uh, you know, dating, you know, that's 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 gonna give you the power.